Hello everyone and welcome back to the Color Spotlight series. I know it has been quite a while and first and foremost, I just want to thank you all for understanding during this past month full of medical issues and my travel. I am all right at the moment and I am home and I am excited to get back to our videos. So let's go ahead and get back to our series and we're going to be diving straight in with a very bold one, Pigment 254 or Pyrrole Red. The pyrrole pigments are a small group of relatively new synthetic pigments that were discovered in the 1980s. There are several pigments in this family that are used regularly for watercolor, and those colors include that pyrrole red that we are taking a look at today, PR254, as well as pyrrole red made from PR270. We also have pyrrole scarlet, which is made from PR255, pyrrole red rubine made from PR264, carmine hue made from PR R274 and pyro orange both made from PO71 and PO73. There are a few varieties that I didn't mention because I didn't recognize them in the watercolor world and they're also used to produce several hybrid pigments with the quinacridone colors. So if you have information that I left out of this little graphic here be sure to let me know in the comments below I would love to hear about them. Back to our featured color today, Pyro Red is a semi-opaque fire engine kind of red. I use it as the warm red on my palette, although it is considered a pretty middle of the road pigment. It doesn't really lean too much one way or the other, and there certainly are oranger tones available on the market. The reason I use it as my warm red is because I don't use oranges very often, and I find that it's easy just to mix some yellow in with this color to get any type of orange that I might need, and it provides a little bit more mixing ability into the other tones that I would use a red for. It is very light fast, deeply valued, highly staining, and has a very high tinting strength. It is an intensely bright red and handprint does report that it doesn't have much of a drying shift, although I have found in my own uses it does undergo quite a large drying shift, especially when you're using it diluted with a lot of water. This particular shade of red is a pretty popular color amongst watercolorists and it's one of handprint's top 40 pigments. It tends to be more light fast than other similar pigments like the naphthol reds and it's less toxic of course than the cadmium reds. We're going to move on to our brand comparisons now, and I will say that I primarily am familiar with Daniel Smith and Windsor and Newton's version of this pigment. Those are the ones that I've had consistently in my palette since I started using professional watercolors. That being said, I have acquired many other samples over the years to share with you, so let's go ahead and take a look at those. Daniel Smith and Rembrandt's versions are the darkest and deepest out of all the samples I have here for you, and both of them are a tad bit more opaque than the others. M. Graham and Core do tend to be the brightest and most pigmented versions of this color that I have, but that's not that surprising considering those two brands' reputations. Holbein's does seem to be the lightest, and it almost has kind of that glowing characteristic that PR209 has, but all the other swatch cards that I have here are somewhere in the middle of the pack, and none of them perform poorly from what I can tell. The one that you might want to use on your palette could either be determined by whatever is available in your area, or if you do have a slight preference on a specific hue or value that you might see here. Next up, it is time for the color mixing, and I know a lot of you said in the last video that I did that you actually preferred the stills to watching me paint out the swatches, but just as many of you guys said that you do like to watch the swatch paintings as well. So I have both here in this video, and you can either watch the whole thing or skip towards the end if you don't want to see all of the painting portions. I will make a note here that I did have a very hard time balancing the color in this particular video because of the hues of the red it kind of messed with my color settings but I did my best and again if you want to skip ahead to the still with a scanned image that will have a more accurate representation of the colors mixed today. Now first up we have an odd duck. I know this isn't a color that most people have on their palettes but I wanted to go ahead and include titanium gold ochre from Schmincke. This is made from PBR24 and it's not super common but it makes a really cool range of colors when mixed with the pyro red. There's anything from like this deep corally pink color to a rosy Caucasian skin tone and even something that you might want to consider using for a strawberry blonde color 
all of which I thought were really pretty and uh, worth showing off here in this video. If you don't have a PBR24 in your collection, other yellow ochre type colors would also fit in here as well as PY53, which sometimes go the, goes by the name of Rutile Yellow, uh, would also work to make similar tones. In addition to that muted yellow, I also wanted to show you the uh, kind of other side of the spectrum, I guess, with the fiery oranges that this red can make when mixed with a warm yellow. I just chose a standard PY65 for this range so that you can see a wide gamut of uh, reddish orange to yellow orange colors. Next up, I wanted to take a second to talk about mixing purples from colors like Pyrrole Red. I find that I can get the most vibrant purples and violets when I mix a cool red with just about any blue. The temperature of the blue doesn't really matter. I mean, you will get different shades of violet, but that cool red is really, really important. If you have a warm red or this middle toned red, it's nearly impossible to get a bright purple. To that end, I decided to show you some red violets that I could mix using this color, but to do that, I had to use dioxazine violet. PV23 is a cool purple, but since it is much closer to red than any blue would be, we can get some really lovely purple tones out of it, though you will still note that these are rather muted purples and not a bright, vibrant purple that you would get with a cool red or magenta. I did still choose a blue to show you. I chose a cool one and that is Thalo Blue Green Shade. We're gonna get some nice brick reds when we just use a tiny bit of the blue with the Pyrrole Red, but we can also get pretty darn close to a black. Both of these colors have a hint of yellow in them, which means there's all three primaries involved and we can get closer to that dark neutral tone. Just as a little aside, I did want to note here, I mentioned earlier in the video as well, that this color is kind of a bully. Um, the, this Pyrrole Red can hold its own against a phthalo color. It's very easy to tip the hue one way or another by having too much of one or the other, meaning that the red is just as powerful as this phthalo blue, if that helps you put into perspective what type of amount of the color you would use when you're mixing it with other colors. I probably should have done a phthalo green next, but we're gonna get there in just a moment. In the meantime, we have our PR254 mixed with sap green. The sap green is from Daniel Smith, of course, and these two complements are both lighter in value on their own. Both the red and the green contain a fair amount of yellow, and when mixed, we're not going to get a black or a gray. Instead, we're going to get some lovely shades of brown when we get right in the middle, and on either side, we'll get some more of those those brick reds and olive greens. Finally, in our last row, we have phthalo green blue shade, which is probably as close to an opposite as we can commonly find for pyro red. Uh, like the phthalo blue, it is hard to find an exact middle ground because both of these colors are powerhouses. So your neutral will want to lean towards one or the other. But if you try hard enough, you can get a very deep gray that is almost black in color. And when you go ahead and throw some more water into that mix and dilute it, you can get a softer gray as well. At the bottom of the page, we have some of our property tests, like the dispersion is the first one there, and that shows that at least the Daniel Smith variety of this pigment doesn't move a whole lot in water. The second one is a lifting test that you will see finished in just a moment on the still that does glaze very well because uh, it is a very staining color, which we will see on the next spot there. It was very hard to lift even on wood pulp or cellulose paper, which typically even staining colors will lift fairly well off of this. And you can see here, I had some trouble. And the last one there is my softening off technique. So I put the pigment on to the paper with the paper dry, and then I add water to it to try and pull the color uh, into a diluted or gradient wash. You can see that there is a pretty prominent back run, which Handprint did confirm when I went to look it up that this pigment does bloom very readily in water. So if that is a property that you like, it would be a good choice. If it's something you wanna stay away from, then you might wanna be a little bit more careful with this one. All right, guys, so we are coming to the demonstration portion of this painting. And as you guys might already know, these videos take a ton of time to plan, record, voiceover, edit, 
all that jazz. And because they take so much longer than a lot of other videos on my channel, sometimes the process can be a little bit frustrating or I just feel like, oh, I wish I was done with this video already. But that was so not the case with this painting. I had so much fun with this mythical beast for our series of Color Spotlight Unicorns. And I am really, really happy with the way that this painting turned out and I can't wait to share the results with you. As I was trying to come up with an animal for the concept for this color, a lot of ideas came to mind. I usually have to decide is the color that we're spotlighting, is it going to be the main color in the animal? Or are we going to use that color to mix other colors? And I eventually came back around to the idea that I really wanted to do a beta fish. I had a beta named Alpha and he was bright red. I immediately thought, aha, this is perfect. It's super, super red. We can really showcase this color to its greatest extent with this animal. And I thought he looked pretty cute with a horn as well. I started looking for different reference photos and I found two on Pixabay. One was that really red coloration that I remember my beta fish being. And the other one had a much more beautiful movement to the photograph and just had this really pleasant um, composition, I guess. So I combined those two ideas. I changed a couple little things myself, and this is the result that I came up with. If you guys have ever seen a red betta fish in person, they are just red. There's like no variation in them. So I wanted to try and figure out a way to incorporate some of the color mixing into this piece and to show a little bit of variation both in value and in hue. I decided to go ahead and add a warm yellow for some of the highlighted areas like the top of the head and the back and then some areas on the fins. And I also added some Payne's gray for the darker areas, such as in the creases of the fins and where things would be overlapping each other. As per usual, I finished off with some splatters and some white ink. And I think that's gonna pretty much wrap up this painting. Before I go, I did want to drop in a couple little reminders and housekeeping type of notes for the channel. I do still owe you guys a Q&A video for the 25k that I gathered questions for a couple weeks ago. I will absolutely get that for you as soon as I am able to do so. I'm, it's just going to take a lot of uh, time to get those questions together and I haven't been up for it before now, but I'm going to start working on that now that I am back home. Um, I also have like a billion ideas for other videos that I want to get done and all of them seem equally as amazing to do right now. So I do have to decide what order those are coming in. Perhaps my patrons can help me figure that out with another poll. Um, but I also just wanted to let you guys know that I am home now and I am excited to be producing more content again and hope to see you around as we head into the end of summer. I also wanted to remind you that there are just a couple days left for World Watercolor Month. These zipper pouch sales, both on the World Watercolor Month store, as well as the contributions from my Etsy shop sales, are still being donated to the Dreaming Zebra Foundation through the end of the month. So if you want to pick anything up last minute, now is the time to do so. I do wish that I had more time to dedicate to WWM this year, but I hope that you guys all had a wonderful time with it, and it has been so much fun following the hashtag over on Instagram. So I think that's it. I think that's everything for the video. I, of course, want to thank you all for watching. Please consider giving this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed the content, and let me know in the comments below if PR254 is on your palette, and if so, what some of your favorite uses for it are. If you're new to the channel, be sure to subscribe to see more watercolor content and hit that bell if you'd like to be notified for the next video. As always, an extra special thanks to my patrons for helping make this video possible, and I will see you in the next video. Happy painting!